and we've lost in 31 states. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've lost um, in, in states where we thought we were going to win. Mm -hmm. And so it's nerve wracking, the thought of going forward. And it's not just the prospect of losing, but it's the prospect of going into a very negative campaign in which the politics of distraction and fear, uh, you know, of, of bringing up issues that are unrelated, that aren't true, of really uh, casting a, a slur upon who we are as a people. Yes. Um, you know, that's the real damage of, of this, of this, the potentiality of this campaign. Um, but I actually believe that it will stop in Minnesota. Hi, I'm Dr. Marge Charmley. I'm a licensed psychologist and I'm the chair of the Marriage Equality Task Force of the Minnesota Psychological Association. I'm also the producer and co-host of By Cities, a cable television program that serves to educate people about the gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender community. Hello, I'm Dr. Anita Kozan. I'm a licensed speech and language pathologist in both healthcare and education. One of my specialties is working with the voice and speech needs of persons who are transgender, both women and men. I've also worked as an advisor for Gay Straight Alliances in the St. Paul Public Schools. Along with Dr. Charmley, I am the co-host and co-producer of Bi Cities. In November 2012, Minnesotans will be asked to go to the polls to vote on a constitutional amendment which would limit and define marriage as being between one man and one woman. It's already against the law in Minnesota for same-sex couples to marry. If this constitutional amendment passes, it will make it extremely difficult to overturn this discriminatory legislation. As Senator Scott Dibble noted in the opening segment of this program, the campaign to pass the marriage amendment may very well cast a slur on who we are as gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender people. Such a campaign is likely to affect our friends, family, and allies as well. While we are hoping that Minnesotans will rise above this and vote no on the marriage amendment, as we move toward Election Day, you might experience some or all of what other GLBT and people have encountered in the face of anti-gay initiatives and discrimination. We at Bi Cities are pleased to collaborate with the Minnesota Psychological Association in a two-part program. In this part, part one, we are going to talk about the points of stress and the bases for resilience that you might experience as the anti-gay marriage amendment campaign unfolds. We will also be sharing the stories of some of our guests on Bi Cities who have faced prejudice and discrimination and found their way with the hope that that will enable you to tap into your own resilience and courage and stand up as a proud member of our community. We know that as we face anti-gay initiatives, it is very easy to feel alone. We want you to know that you are not alone. There is a lot of support surrounding you, not only within the gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender communities, but with our friends and allies from all walks of life. Some of the stress that you might experience in the coming months may stem from coming to understand just how widespread homophobia still is. You might have to grapple with the sense of being hated by people who don't even know you. You might also feel scared of the power of those among the religious right and others who have brought forth this amendment. You may feel angry at heterosexual people who say they support gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender people, but do nothing. You may find yourself being more upset by anti-gay graffiti, comments, and jokes. You may also find that you lose your sense of faith in the world as a safe and fair place. You might feel angry or sad because friends and family don't understand the huge impact of the marriage amendment on your life. You may not feel supported by your family who may have different views about the marriage amendment, different than you do. You may feel a sense of shame about being bi, lesbian, gay, or transgender. You may find that you want to be less out. You may also find that you're turning more to alcohol and drugs 
as a way to cope. On the positive side, you might find that people whom you didn't expect to support you do support you. You might feel the understanding and support of your family and friends. And you might feel supported by heterosexual public figures who are working to defeat the marriage amendment. I know I do. You may develop a sense of compassion for other marginalized groups in society. You may come to feel a sense of pride about the gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender communities. You may also come to see the gay, lesbian, bi, and transgender civil rights movement as part of the greater civil rights movement in the United States. Finally, you may have more of an opportunity to connect with other gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender people and have a chance to make a positive impact on the GLBT community. We hope that by learning more about what other gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people have experienced in the face of anti-gay initiatives, that you will better understand some of your own reactions to what you might experience in the coming months. We also hope that by knowing this, you won't feel so alone and will know that others, including Marge and myself, share your experiences as well. Now we would like to introduce you to several remarkable people that we have met on Bi Cities. Theirs are stories of courage, strength, and resilience in the face of prejudice and discrimination. They have faced them and prevailed. Kara Partington was a guest on Bi Cities a couple of years ago. Tune into her story as she talks about what it was like to be rejected by peers as a lesbian high school student. So I'll start with the piece that okay. kind of, um, I guess it's a jump start to the whole story, so we'll go backwards from okay. this moment. Um, the piece that I'll read is uh, from a little book that I've written called The Park Bench Sermon, um, and it's called Me and the Frog. For as long as I can remember, I always was the most competitive. The game wasn't worth playing unless you won. Do you do it for fun? Well, that's not enough. Until the girls got to me. Once they did, it was a new ball game. A game I wanted nothing to do with. No one entered the pool at our team parties. No one invited me to sleepovers for fear that I may invite myself into one of their sleeping bags, as if. I was good enough to be their goalie, but I wasn't good enough to be their friend. I wasn't good enough to go out for dinner with them after the games, the wins, and the losses. Four years of being their goalie and nothing more. Four years of convincing myself that being the goalkeeper was enough. Four years of believing that the way they treated me was okay. Districts U17C2. We won our first game because of a forfeit. The second game was yet to be determined. I arrived on time ready to stretch myself out because no one was willing to get near the dike. Warm up, toss the ball back and forth with my coach. Then a scream. The girls had found a toad while they were warming up on the other side of the field. Then a roundup and she goes for the shot, hurls the toad in the air with her Nike cleat. I went into panic mode, dashed over to the girls and asked them where it was. Helpless and green, not a toad, but a little tree frog. Picking it up, I heard them shouting, that thing isn't sanitary, throw it in the trash, what are you doing? Growing further and further away from the yells and the hate, I walked over to a fence enclosing a small pond. Opening my hand, I realized that it only had three legs. A little trail of blood made its way through the creases in my palm like a trickling creek. She had kicked off its leg. Not worth looking for, it blended in with the other grass blades that had been kicked and ripped by the spikes on our cleats. Waiting patiently to see if it was going to jump from the safety and warmth of my hand, I talked to the frog. I wanted to leave then and there and take it home, nurse it back to health, and call it my own. Oh, it jumped, landed in the reeds. I chose to believe that it found its way to the water. As I walked back to the field, my gloves tucked into the pack back of my goalie pants. I decided to throw the game. I was angry, angry for the frog and angry for myself. I was done, it was over. My relationship with my soccer team had reached an end. I continued to warm up with the little secrets during the back of my mind. Lined up for the first half, parents on the sidelines cheering 
some sneering, is that a boy playing in the goal? What narrow-minded suburbanites. The first half went okay, too good in fact. After grabbing some water, I listened to my idiotic teammates talk about the girls in the opposing team, their body, their ability, judging like the turf were a runway. The whistle blew, top of the second. Thirty minutes in, I began to wonder if I would have a chance to put my plan into action. And then, like clockwork, a breakaway. She came towards me, wound up, just like the girl who mistook the frog to be a soccer ball. And here it comes. There it is, and I dive for it, missing it by a hair just as I had planned. Perfection. My teammates disappointed, the other team cheering. That's the only goal I let in. It was just enough. Three long blows on the whistle, and the game was over. Good game, good game, good game, good game, good game. That day, I walked off the field complete. We weren't going on to state. The season was over. I was free, never bound to come back. I had finished what I set out to do. As I crossed the boundary lines for the last time, a smile stretched happily from ear to ear. I had won. I had won for me, me and the frog. Wow, Anita. Every time I see that, I just am so blown away by this young woman. She's incredible. I mean, she's intelligent, beautiful, talented, and what she has accomplished already in her life, the adversity she has faced and how she has come through it, that's just an incredible clip and so inspiring. Yes, it is. And inspirational is the word on that. Well, now we'd like you to meet Reverend Dr. James Fountain. Reverend Dr. Fountain was a Methodist minister of a huge church with over 2,000 members in the South. A minister for over 30 years, he came out as gay and lost his opportunity to work as a minister. He also had to reconcile his religious faith with his sexual orientation. Let's listen and hear how he came to do that. I was, a, was and continued to be an ordained minister, but had pastored uh, several churches over a period of almost 30 years. And uh, during that whole period of time, really from the age of eight, uh, I began to realize that there was something different about me and that uh, you know my attractions were not uh, to the opposite sex, but to the same sex. And so uh, I struggled with that. Uh, took and went through all types of turmoil, as you can imagine, as a minister, you know, praying and pleading with God and saying, God, you know, that what's wrong with me? Why am I this way? Why do I have these feelings? You know, why do I have these emotions? Went to psychiatrists, uh, uh, you know, went to people that are quote unquote in deliverance ministry and said, would you cast this devil out of me? And, you know, just went through a whole huge turmoil. Uh, of course, during this, in this period of time, I was also married and uh, had a wonderful wife, she's still a wonderful person, and uh, you know, just, just a, a great partner, a great person to, to, to be with, but uh, that's not where I was coming from. You know, I, I really hid behind that, and all that was a place of safety uh, for me as a minister. Even though I was faithful to her my entire marriage and never had any type of experience with, uh, you know, sexual experience with anything but with her. And so uh, here, uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, in my morning devotions, uh, I read through Proverbs and Psalms each month. And uh, I came to Psalms 51, and in Psalms 51, uh, most people who read Psalms and Proverbs knows and understand that that's where God says that we were formed and shaped in our mother's womb, uh, and uh, that we were born of our mothers. And the following verse there, he says, that God says that he desires truth on the inward part that his wisdom might be known to us. And so as I read that, that scripture passage, I really sensed the presence of God speaking to me and saying, James, he said, I want you to be true to who you were created to be in your mother's womb. And so that began a great uproar on the inside of me because now I had to do this. I had to reconcile what God was trying to say to me. Did that have to do with my internal battle that I'd had for years and all and having desire uh, for, for men? Or was God trying to say something else to me? And so over a period of a year, God really refined what he was saying to me 
and brought me through a tremendous time of fasting and, and study of scripture and all to come to find out that God said to me in my heart, I don't hear him audibly, but in my heart and my spirit, God said to me, James, you're wonderfully and fearfully made. And he says, it didn't catch me by surprise that you were gay. He said, I've known you were gay from the beginning of time. And, and uh, it, it just brought a tremendous amount of faith in my heart to know that, that God accepted me just as I am. And so that began the uproar about, well, God, I'm married, you know, <laughs> what do I do about this? Well, Anita, you know, as we watch this clip of James Fountain, what isn't readily apparent is that this man struggled with a number of dark days to the point of even having contemplated suicide. And his ability to reconcile his faith and sexual orientation were a very powerful part of his story. I am, I am just struck by the huge amount of work that he did, as well as deeply touched by his, his choosing to stay faithful in his marriage as he dealt with all of his issues with sexual orientation. I admire him greatly. Yeah. yeah, he's a friend to both of us. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. People from multicultural backgrounds who are marginalized on the basis of more than one part of their personal identities can face even greater challenges in coming out and finding self-acceptance. Such is the case with Chung Mua, a young Hmong woman who had to reconcile her coming out with the beliefs of the Hmong community as well as their spiritual backgrounds. And to also learn um, within the shaman religion and Christian religion how um, I can still be empowered and not let that um, keep me um, from expressing or understanding who I am. How did you reconcile that? I mean, I don't know how the shaman religion or, you know, I know what the Christians sometimes think about. Mm -hmm. GLBT folks, but what what, what is shaman? What, what's their uh, well, shamanism in shamanism uh, religion, it's it's uh, not accepted because they feel that as a spirit um, born as a man or a woman, uh, you have restrictions, and so um, homosexuality is not accepted um, in shamanism because then the spirits are not um, compatible, and so that could uh, hurt you um, spiritually, and so that's what the shaman belief is. Um, Half of my fami family is sh follows shamanism, half follows Christianity. So I was able to have that advantage to see both views. Um, how I reconciled was through um, reaching out to other um, LGBTQ among people who are also uh, people of faith um, who are Christians as well. And so just talking with them, connecting with them, and just really understanding um, um, God and the, and the love that I have for others really reconciled um, the questions that I had. You know, as I understand it, in the Hmong religion, what they believe is that each person is born with a spirit that is somehow consistent with their identity. And if a person comes out as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, the ancestors believe that the spirit no longer matches the person. And so unfortunately, people are often um, shunned. You know, the, the children, the family members who come out are, are no longer talked to, they're not welcome in the home, they're no longer part of the family, and it's, it's a terrible experience for them to go through. In fact, you know, when we did the interview with Chong Mua and with Kevin Zhang uh, from Shades of Yellow, the support community for uh, persons who are Hmong, uh, Kevin told us that uh, a story that it was either his mother or his grandmother told him that in the old country, before the Hmong people came to the United States after they helped the U.S. so much in, in uh, the Vietnam War, that there was a family where they had a seven-year-old boy and somehow the family knew that this boy was different in his either, I don't know if it was his sexual orientation or his gender identity, 
but they took him out into a forest and left him there to fend for himself. It was like he was no longer a part of their family. And that just, I mean, that's just achingly painful. And so the, the Shades of Yellow organization is just incredible in how it has helped people to, to have a family as they are coming out. Yes. And again, the clip that you saw of Chong, you would never imagine that she had to overcome all of that backdrop in her own life in order to be where she was and is today. It is estimated that 160,000 students skip school every day to avoid being bullied. Survey data indicate that 86% of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender students report that they have been a victim of bullying. Jamie Nabosny was bullied in high school to the point of nearly being killed. The bullying started at a fairly young age. Ultimately, he sued the school officials of his Ashland, Wisconsin middle school and high school for not protecting him. And in 1996, a jury returned a verdict against the school officials, making Jamie's landmark case the first successful legal challenge to anti-gay violence in public schools. But it just escalated things. And so from, you know, you know, pretty much harassment that would happen every few days, it began daily verbal harassment, and then the, the physical stuff started. I was kicked in the back, I was spit on, I was punched, um, I had things thrown at me in the hallways. And it just continued to escalate. And um, you know, I, I'll kind of fast forward to uh, I had uh, three suicide attempts in junior high and high school, just trying to escape what was happening mm -hmm. to me. And then eventually, my last beating um, that I suffered, actually, I had to be um, taken by ambulance to the hospital. And I had to have abdominal surgery, exploratory surgery for internal bruising, bleeding, and um, other internal uh, issues. And I knew I couldn't ever go back. I knew that if I went back, they would actually kill you me. Had, what, what helped you get through that? I mean, you know, I, I saw the film. I saw the depictions of you. I mean, beat up to the hospital, urinated on it. I mean, it was terrible. Yeah. What, what got you through that? I think the biggest thing was my family. I had an extremely supportive family, and, and when you see the film, and you even, even in the trailer, you can see that my mom was a huge part of my life. My father was as well. Mm -hmm. um, my father wasn't available for the film, um, to, for the, when the film was being made, but my father was there 100%, um, just as much and sometimes more than my mom, because my mom would get very emotional, upset, and she couldn't communicate as well. Mm -hmm. um, and my dad was there for me, and my dad was the one that spoke out, went to Congress with me and testified um, to try to Ooh. get the, the laws changed in this country. My dad did a lot of public speaking. Um, my dad was really there for me when I needed him to be. Um, but I think both of them being there for me, and then my brothers as well, my extended family. And the other thing I think that came from my family was no matter what happened to me, I always knew that this wasn't about me. This wasn't about me being gay. It was about the kids that were doing this to me. It was about their families that were teaching them these things, that who I was wasn't okay, that I was less than human. And it was ultimately about school officials who said I wasn't okay. And it was their issue and their problem, not about me. And that really, I think, came from my family. And, and you know, I had a gay uncle from a young age that I knew about. And that really was a helpful thing in a lot of ways for me to see how my family responded to him. I knew I came out when I was 11. Kids didn't come out when they were 11. I mean, I would have been, um, that would have been 86. You know, Can you tell the story smokes. about the uncle and the Cadillac? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Your gay uncle. And so when I was young, my uncle would come to visit. And, you know, I knew that my uncle was actually homosexual is what everybody or, used right, the yeah, word. Yeah. And so I probably, you know, I had a hard time pronouncing the word, but I knew the word. Um, and so he'd come to visit. And he was really the only person in my family who, like, left town, went away. And he was managing, like, you know, five-star hotels, restaurants, that sort of thing. And he always had a Cadillac. I mean, that was just it. You know, he'd always come home in his Cadillac. And I was obsessed. Like, you know, I would lie in the back seat. I would play with the buttons. <laughs> I, I just loved his Cadillac. And I would even take naps in the back seat of the car. My mom just thought this was crazy. And so he'd left, and I was um, spending the night with my grandma. And we were lying, watching TV. And I said to her, um, Grandma, I think I'm a homosexual. 
and you know, I'm sure from a seven-year-old kid, she was kind of surprised. She didn't know what to say, and she just looked at me. She said, honey, you don't have to be gay to have a Cadillac. <laughs> Jamie's story was made into a documentary called Bullied. His is truly a story of courage, resilience, and fortitude. We hope that the stories of Kara, James, Chong, and Jamie will help you to reach inside and find your own resilience if you are struggling with any of the anti-gay rhetoric and sentiments that are emanating from the anti-gay marriage amendment campaign. Remember that if you are struggling with some of your feelings, you're not alone. There are people who love and care about you who are there to support you. If you are having difficulty finding support, if you are feeling isolated and alone, if you are having difficulty eating and sleeping, if you are having trouble making your life work, and most especially, if you are thinking that your life is not worth living, there are therapists who can help you. Three of the four people that you just met, Kara, James, and Jamie, reached out for help and found therapists who helped get them through rough times. As you can see, they have all found their way, and you can too. Kara had an especially powerful experience in therapy. While not everyone will have that kind of experience, hers is a story of what can happen when you reach out for support and tap into your own ability to heal. We will end with Kara's story about therapy. A list of resources will be run during the credits that can assist you in finding professional support if you are in need of that. The woman who took me through my entire journey um, when I was discharged from the hospital for three years, she was my therapist. I firmly believe that she saved my life this past summer. Um, I saw her twice a week. It went over the time slot practically every time. I, she gave me her phone number. I could text her. We emailed. We talked on the phone. Any form of communication that I needed, she was there. Um, yesterday afternoon, I was informed that she collapsed and died suddenly. Um, and it was, the first thought was, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I don't have somebody to keep me in line, you know? Oh. And um, so I just want to honor Carolyn Mueller with every single thing that I've told you today in this interview. I could not have told you had it not been for her because she showed me that it was okay to be gay, that it was, femininity was not wearing a stiletto, that I was beautiful, that I had things to give to people, and that everything people said they liked about me was mine. So I would just like to say that, Carolyn, no. I love you. Yeah, and we're so sorry about her loss, but I just want to say as a therapist mm -hmm. myself that we can't do it if we don't have someone like you. <laughs> and that what you have in your heart and soul, I'm sure gave her many hours of pleasure, yeah. that you went on your journey, that you did so well, and by you being you, you are um, honoring her life as well, but mostly yours. Thank you for watching this joint collaboration of the Minnesota Psychological Association and By Cities. We hope that you will also watch part two of this program, which will focus on sources of support from within the GLBT community and from our friends and allies. Thank you for joining us.